Um, and he had these two mics, and I'm thinking, what in the world? We have a backup in case one goes wrong, but uh, this is for here, and this one here is for the international, our international following on Skype. So we're, we've gotten pretty big now, you know. We need. Um, today we're, we're starting a new, new series in Zephaniah. Raise your hand if you've ever read through Zephaniah before this week. That's about what I expected, yeah? All right, raise your hand if you're able to go to Zephaniah within just a few moments. A, a, a few of you, all right. Um, Zephaniah is a small book, uh, similar to Habakkuk. It's only got three chapters. Not the smallest of the minor prophets, but it is a small book. However, it is a very important book because it's kind of a summary of all of the the minor prophets, the pre-exilic, meaning the prophets speaking before they got taken away to Babylon. It kind of encapsulates all of the prophets together, the story. Um, this morning, we're going to kind of, we're going to go to class. And I'm going to kind of teach you some, some, uh, some tricks about uh, finding Zeph Zephaniah, uh, understanding the Old Testament, and then we're going to look at the, uh, hopefully God's going to, to really grab our hearts as we look at the general message throughout uh, Zephaniah. So did you know there's a combination to the Old Testament? There's a combination to access the Old Testament. And I'm sure some of you have heard this. The combination is 512-5512. Has anyone ever heard that? 512-5512. Everyone say 512, 5512. 512. All right, so now you have the outline of the Old Testament. Five, there's, oh, let me, probably should advance my slides. Oh, I forgot to tell you, the general theme of, of uh, Zephaniah is judgment or protection. Judgment or protection. So it's 512, 5512. First, you got the books of the law. Then you have the history, then you have poetry, uh, and you have five major prophets and 12 minor prophets. So now you have the general outline of the Old Testament, 512, 5512. Um, and hold on a second, I haven't preached for my computer in a long time. I've got to get used to it again. So today, we're in the minor prophets. Oops. Wrong button. Today we're in the minor prophets. And the, these are the minor prophets. Hosea, Joel, and so on. How many of you can say the minor prophets? In order. How many of you who are over 18 can say the minor prophets? In order. All right. <laughs> kids, kids, kids can memorize that stuff. I have to come up with a story. Do you want to hear my story? You're going to hear it anyway. Um, <laughs> so here's my story. Um, it goes like, like that. <laughs> um, can you advance to the next, uh, yeah, no, it's got to go back and let's see if we, there we go. No, back, back. <laughs> Should be a, an animation where part of the slide removes from there. There we go. All right, so it goes like this. Daniel's the last of the major prophets. So I picture Daniel holding a hose, trying to spray away the, the evil, you know, of, the, of sin. Um, and he's spraying, but Jel, Joel comes out, but he misses. And someone says, oh boy, we're going to die. Obadiah. And so uh, out of the hose comes a whale and out pops Jonah, who falls on the Formica floor. And as he's getting up, he's about knee high, Nahum, to someone who grabs him by his back, Habakkuk, and points him to the Zephyr, which is an old Lincoln car back in the day, before I was around. Um, uh, Zephaniah which is being driven by an old haggy guy, Haggai. And as you get in, there's a Zechariah, Zechariah. 
And next to the sakurai is uh, an Italian chef, Malachi. Malachi. And as you, as, as you get those crazy stories in your brain, it's really easy to, to then say, oh, okay, I know that's after the sack of rye. You know? So anyway, that's me. Here's a, uh, this is a, this is a Zephyr, by the way. Very distinctive car. All right, anyway, that's, that's, that's my brain working. Um, so today we're in, in Zephaniah. And Zephaniah uh, preached after Israel, the northern kingdom, had been taken away by, um, by the Assyrians. But before Babylon had conquered Judah and, and the Assyrians and taken away the southern kingdom. He perhaps... Um, well, he is, um, a, lot of, a lot of stuff happened during Zephaniah's life as he was growing up. He saw the evils of, of, of the kings after Hezekiah. He saw the temple uh, being dishonored. He saw icon and, and idol worship. He saw high places being built up. And uh, basically, he's preaching against all of these sins and stuff. Um, if you want another... You know, here's a kind of an outline of all the, the minor prophets. If you're interested, I can get you that. Or you just search on the internet. There's a lot of stuff like this out there. Um, but on there, you can see, like, where they preached, who they preached to, what they were preaching, and even what their, their name means. And if you so, you've seen me speak before about it with an introduction, you know, I really love Charles Swindoll's overviews of, of his books. And you'll see in this on this overview, if you can see on the, up there on top, uh, he, Judgment and Doom. So it's going to be a fun study. It's all about Judgment and Doom. Uh, in, in, in chapter 1, verse 2, he, he talks about wiping everyone out. Just destroying everyone. The Lord will destroy everyone. But... There's hope. As with all the minor prophets and all the prophets, when they talk doom, they also provide hope. And that's the way God is. He always provides a way out. He always provides relief for his people, for his remnant. Uh, some of the highlights on here. The theme. The theme is the judgment and doom are certain unless there's repentance before God. And only then can there be hope and restoration. Um, and another um, highlight here is Christ in Zephaniah. It says, Jesus Christ hides us from God's wrath and is the one who will someday rule the earth as king of Israel. We'll, we're going to look at that a little later because that's, that's key, I think, to understanding the book of Hezekiah, uh, sorry, Hezekiah, Zechariah, uh, Zephaniah. I'll get it right. Let's read the first uh, verse, but before we do, let's pray. Father, I pray that you would calm my nerves. Help me to focus on your word. Help us all to focus on you and glorifying you, hearing from you, and knowing what your will for us is based on your word. In Jesus Christ. Amen. Wasn't the worship awesome this morning? I love that, by the way. The, they talk, it talked about hiding us, or we're trying to hide our sin. And that's what Zephaniah, one of the verses that, I, that God gave me through Zephaniah, scared me. Uh, and we'll get into this later because we can't hide our sin, right? We can't hide our sin. Anyway, Zephaniah 1 1 says, The word of the Lord which came to Zephaniah, son of Cushi, son of Gedaliah, son of Amariah, uh, son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. And so that's on the list. That was my verse. And so let's get into figuring out who this guy Zephaniah is. There's not a lot 
said about Zephaniah. It's not like we can go to the book of Chronicles and learn about his life. All what we know is what I just basically read and in, in, in his book. Zephaniah, though, was interesting as he was the great grandson of Hezekiah. And if you notice there, Josiah was also a great grandson. Oh, you can't see that, can you? Very well. Basically, Josiah was also a great grandson of Hezekiah, you know, di diverging uh, lineage. But that means that Hezekiah was, was a patriarch for both Josiah and Zephaniah. So, Josiah and Zephaniah, or encouragement, he started saying, We need to clean up the temple. We need to get the people back to worshiping the true God. And so he, he did. He decreed to start cleaning up the temple. And it was in cleaning up the temple that they found the book of the law, which had been buried for you know, 12, 15, 20 years. No one had read the book of the law until it was found by the uh, Hillel, one of the workers. So the, the book was brought to Josiah. Josiah had it read to him, to which he fully repented of Judah's sins. He tore his royal garments, um, and he initiated one of, the, one of the strictest and fiercest reforms that Judah's ever seen. Tearing down the idols, tearing down the high places, killing the priests who dared to go against the Lord, and... Uh, it was a, a fierce time. Zephaniah, we believe, had a very big part in turning the king's heart in his preaching. And this book had a very big part in turning the king's heart initially. The name Zephaniah means... Yahweh has hidden or protected, which is very apropos for this book. Uh, in verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 3, he says, Seek the Lord, all you humble of the earth who have practiced his ordinances. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you will remain hidden on the day of the Lord's anger. Perhaps you will remain hidden. And it's not a Maybe God will help you if you turn to him. No, it's a, you, he will help you. It's just the, the, uh, the uh, terminology they use there in their translation that uh, makes it sound a little iffy. But it, it means you will be hidden in the time of his anger. And that makes us think back in, to the day of when, when God swept through Egypt, killing all of the, the firstborn of the people who did not have the lamb, blood of the lamb on their door frame. God swept through, but the blood of the Lamb hid the Israelites from this great um, and horrible judgment. And that's the same imagery we hear, see here. And you'll see also throughout, well, especially in the first chapter, uh, it talks very heavily about the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord is a time of judgment now and is a coming day of judgment. And Zephaniah points to both of those throughout the book. And the day of the Lord, the day, uh, or that day when, when um, Israel was saved from, from Egypt is often considered and called the day in Israelite, I mean, in, in Israel uh, writings. It's the day. And it's thought that that's where the actual term, the day of the Lord, started from, developed. It was the day that God judges his enemies and saves his people. And so when you think of the day of the Lord, we think of judgment and destruction, but also we need to also think of salvation of his people. He spares his people through the judgment of, of his enemies. Judgment is coming. 
and it's here. Uh, one, of the worst, one of the worst judgments I've always uh, thought was God removing his hand of, how would I say, limitation on you. Uh, was, he says, all right, you run with that sin and see where that gets you. And he just lets you go. And we see that happening all over the world, don't we? We see people that God has removed his hand of limitation on this world, on individuals, and we see some amazingly awful things going on uh, with people. And it's because God's just let them go. That is the greatest judgment here on earth, is for God to remove his, his protection, remove his favor from our lives. Now, uh, don't get me wrong. I don't believe a Christian can lose his salvation. But non-Christians are going to get so far away from God and, and reject him so much that he just removes himself from them. Uh, and he, he just allows them to go. Um, he, he, in Romans, it talks about, well, you know what Romans talks about, just the, the sexual sin that he allows to run rampant because of the their sin. He just lets them go. And you, 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 you work yourself into such a pit and you're so miserable. Daily we hear about um, famous people and rich people just hitting rock bottom, committing suicide because they're not happy. Because they've, they've gone after their heart's desire and they're not happy because that's not what makes you happy. It's not this world that makes you happy. It's only through Jesus Christ can we have fulfillment. Judgment is coming. Have you guys heard about what's happening in Asbury University in America, in Kentucky? In Asbury uh, University, um, it's a Christian college, a Methodist Christian college. Um, uh, last, the 8th, whatever day that was, on the 8th, um, they had their normal chapel, and if you, uh, I was inter saw the interview, uh, and they s said that the the speaker wasn't anything particularly great. In fact, he might even say that he didn't do very well. But after the service, some students stayed to repent and to pray, and other students came and joined them to repent and pray. And then worship team came and they started worshiping, everyone started worshiping together. And since the 8th, their chapel has not been empty of people worshiping, repenting, and uh, praising the Lord. They've, yeah, they've seen hundreds of people uh, Rededicate their lives, you know, uh, come to know the Lord. We got, they got people from all over the United States coming to see what's going on here and be a part of it. Um, it's gotten so big that the, the faculty have had to uh, say, uh, we need to shut down the campus so that people off the campus can't come in and interfere with what's going on here because there are so many people coming on from off campus. Uh, this, this worship has, has extended to many other campuses. Lee University um, is uh, another name, which I'm not sure where that university is, but they've got, they've got something going. People who, were at, who had come to Asbury and then returned back to Lee, they said, why not here? And so they started an ongoing worship. Um, and uh, so there's several, and there's, I think on the way over here, I read an article that, that listed seven different universities, including Purdue University, this is happening on. Um, I, was, I also was reading an article uh, by a guy, he is the lead or chairman of a, 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 a organization in the UK, which is called 24-7 uh, Prayer. And I didn't know about this, but this organization uh, has people praying 24-7, all around the clock, they have people praying. Um, and they've been praying for something like this to happen, of course, and it, it's happening. And um, we see, um, I, we don't know, I don't know if this is a revival, I don't know what a true revival is, but what's cool about this is not led by some famous singer. 
It's not led by a preacher. Actually, there's no leader. It's the Holy Spirit. It's just calling these people to, to repent and worship. So God, in the judgment and in the, the wickedness that is America these days, He's calling the youth, the, those same youth that, that we old people tend to say, you know, that it's a terrible generation. They're the ones who are now rising up and worshiping. And, and it's uh, it made the mainstream news. They reported on it. Um, and so God's getting glory these days despite us. And it's not because of our thinking. Or it's not because of our um, uh, any one wise person coming up with a way to do this, but it's because the Holy Spirit just moves and he makes things happen. Okay, so the date uh, this uh, Zephaniah is from 635 to 625-ish. Um, during the reign of King Josiah, what we talked about, King Josiah started in 640 and he ended in 609. Any of you confused? I hope not, but BC, you know, the dates BC go backwards, right? They, it's like here's a center spot and the dates go to after Amino Domino uh, this way and then bit before Christ that way. Um, and so he was a contemporary of the prophet Jeremiah. And if you are familiar with Jeremiah, he is known as a weeping prophet. Of, uh, he, he, he's preaching to the time of, of great sin because sadly, the reforms of Josiah didn't last. God told Josiah that you are not going to see the, the judgment that is coming on Judah. So, sure enough, Josiah passed away before the judgments came. Josiah's children took, um, took Judah back into idolatry, back into worshiping idols. Um, and that's when God brought Babylon in to, to judge them. But, see, I think that's the point of revival. And we're talking about Asbury, whether it's a revival or not. Uh, I heard some say, well, we'll see if it's a revival if, if it sweeps across the country and the country changes. But I think that's missing the point. Revival is not about changing po a political structure. Revival is not about changing a country. Revival is about changing what? Hearts. It's about changing hearts. And God, God brings judgment, but I believe that before he brings judgment, he brings revival. So that his remnant, his people that he's going to call, will turn to him before that judgment comes. Zephaniah talks about a sure coming judgment on Judah. And he talks about a sure coming judgment on the whole earth. Are you ready? Are we ready? It's kind of scary. Some key verses in Zephaniah. Um, actually, Zephaniah 1.12 is not necessarily a key verse, but it's a, a verse that, that hit me hard, so I wanted to share it. Uh, it says, And it will come about at that time that I will search Jerusalem with lambs, and I will punish the people who are stagnant in spirit, who say in their hearts, The Lord will not do good nor harm. I will punish the people. This changes maybe my thinking. Because my thinking has always been, we live our life, we die, and then there's a great judgment where God separates us. But this is saying that God is searching Jerusalem with lambs. He's searching for complete people who are complacent. He's searching for those 
who, who take him for granted and just kind of dismiss him. He's searching for those people. And what's it say? He will judge them. He will judge them. And is, let, me, let me make a differentiation here. Judgment is not punishment. Okay? Punishment is, you did this wrong, I'm going to hurt you because of it. Judgment is, you did this wrong, I'm going to do this so that you see what you did wrong and repent. Okay? Judgment, the purpose of judgment is repentance. Whether it's the repentance of the person doing the sin, or it's the repentance of the people seeing the consequence of that sin. That is the purpose of, of, of judgment. And so, last night, we, uh, and, and Friday night, we had a school play. Uh, and uh, th it was all about cockroaches. Love the cockroaches. <laughs> but when I read this, after seeing that play, I thought, it's like an uh, exterminator with a flashlight looking for cockroaches, right? The complacent are like cockroaches. Those who, those who don't necessarily see God as anything. They, not, God's not really involved with us. Um, kind of makes me think of, in Revelation, the church of Laodicea. God says, I would rather you be cold or hot, but you're neither. You're like complacent. You're in the middle. And because you're in the middle, I'm going to do what? I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. We're, Jer, uh, Zephaniah calls us to commitment because judgment is coming. Uh, Zephaniah 1.18 says, Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to save them on the day of the Lord's anger. And all the earth will be devoured by fire of the fire of his jealousy. For he will make a complete end, indeed a horrifying one, of all the inhabitants of earth. So Zephaniah is not just talking about Judah. He's also extending to the whole earth. And my wife had a good question. What do you mean he's going to wipe out the whole earth? Does that mean everyone? Well, this language is the same language they used with Noah's time. That God's going to wipe out the earth with a flood. But he saved his people. He saved Noah and his family. And that's what Zephaniah is saying. Repent so that I might save you and hide you in, my day, in the day of judgment. Repent. Zephaniah 2, 3, we've read already, but this is key. This is central to the person of Zephaniah and his message. Seek the Lord, all you humble of the earth, who have practiced his ordinances. Seek righteousness, seek humility, and perhaps you will remain hidden on the day of the Lord's anger. That great day of God's judgment if we are to humble ourselves, seek his righteousness, he will out of the Lamb and protect us from that judgment. Zephaniah not only talks about the present in his day, he not only talks about the great judgment that's coming for the whole world, and then he gives us a way of repenting and being saved and protected from that judgment. He also says in the future there's a glorious future coming. There's a glorious future coming where we can truly, and I'm going to use the word, connect with Jesus Christ and God. Why? Because he has covered us. Uh, Zephaniah 3.17 says, The Lord your God is in your midst, a victorious warrior. He will rejoice over you with joy. Check that out. God's going to rejoice over us. God's going to rejoice over us. It says that when one person comes to know the Lord, what happens? The angels rejoice. God rejoices when we 
come, we will be invited in. He will be quiet in his love. So he rejoices in joy, quiet in his love, and he will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. So his great, quiet love will be rejoicing with shouts of joy. So, we're either under judgment or we're going to be protected from that judgment. And that's, that's the choice that Zephaniah shows us. Um, in Acts, Peter's first sermon, he says, um, Repent. And each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the, uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then down in verse 40, he says, and with many, it says, and with many words, he solemnly testified and kept on urging them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. And that's the New Testament way of saying, be protected from the judgment. Get, be saved from the judgment that is coming. So Zephaniah is a choice, gives us a choice of judgment. Wait, judgment's on this side. Judgment. Sorry. <laughs> and, <laughs> and protection or protection. It's it's, he gives it to you. He says, come to me, all you who are weary. Come to me. Take on my burden. Bow your knee to Jesus Christ, and his blood will protect you and cover you from the judgment that is coming. And as a bonus, we get to have eternity with Jesus Christ starting now. We have an eternal relationship with God. Father, thank you so much for your love. Thank you for the offering of salvation that we might have a connection, a relationship with you, which then opens up all kinds of other opportunities to connect and to, to know your people. Father, I pray that you would call us to repentance whenever we slide. Help us to see you as our mighty King, our everlasting Father. And help us to live a life that brings you glory. In Jesus' name, amen.